There's a hero narrative that we discover in myth and story throughout human history. It tells us something about who we are in our deepest hearts. The archetypal narrative of the hero goes something like this. A child is about to be born. A king or a ruler sees this coming child as a threat. The tyrant arranges for the child to be killed, but somehow the child escapes the tyrant's plan and is then raised in obscurity by simple, ordinary people. As time goes by and the child grows up, he goes on to defeat or kill the tyrant only then to discover that he carries within him some kind of royal bloodline. He was destined from birth for this role. Aristotle tells a version of this hero narrative in his classic tragedy, Oedipus the King. It's the story of Superman, the comic book character who escapes the explosion on Krypton to be adopted by the Kents in the rural United States. This is the narrative of Luke Skywalker, the son of Darth Vader, who grows up to defeat the Empire in Star Wars. It's Harry Potter who escapes from Voldemort's plan to kill him, to be raised in obscurity by his uncle in the Dursley house until one day an owl arrives with a letter. This is the hero that we want to be. This is our fantasy and hope. It relates to us because most of us live in obscurity, our own version of the Kents, or our own place like being a moisture farmer on Tatooine, or living in a closet under the stairs in the chaotic home of our blowhard uncle and bratty cousin. And in our dreams, we wish that we had a royal bloodline or a superpower, something that would elevate us out of the drudgery of our ordinary existence and give us some kind of eternal significance. This hero narrative makes the story of Ruth then confusing, but also compelling. How is it that the book of Ruth comes to be included as sacred scripture. The time of Ruth's canonization was a time when Israel needed some hero narratives. Ruth's story, you heard, is set in the period between the judges and before the kings. So in our Christian Bibles, the book of Ruth is positioned after the book of Judges and right before the book of 1 Samuel. It helps the flow of the story. But in the Jewish Bible, the book of Ruth is part of the Megillot, in between the Song of Songs and Lamentations, considered a much later addition to the canon than the five books of the Torah or the workings of the prophets. We think that Ruth's story might have come into prominence among the people of Israel at the time when the folks were returning from exile in Babylon back to the promised land. In the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that chronicle that period, we hear that those who've remained in Jerusalem have lost their particular identity as the people of God. And so the leaders want to establish order and religious observance once more. In Ezra, we discover that all those who've married foreign, non-Israelite wives and had children with them, all those men are to divorce those wives and abandon them and those children, push them out of the population of the reestablished nation. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> In the midst of the purge of foreigners, however, Someone advocates for the outsider by telling again the story of Ruth. Ruth is a counter-testimony to the reforming spirit of that time of purity and law. First, Ruth is a Moabite. If you're a person of Judah, you do not want a hero who is a Moabite. Moabites are the enemy of your people. The book of Deuteronomy says, 
No Ammonite or Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord to the tenth generation. None of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. You're reestablishing a nation around faithful observance of the Torah. Don't start telling stories that violate the teachings of the Torah. Second, Ruth pledges loyalty to an Israelite widow. She vows to go to Bethlehem to take care of her mother-in-law. Her language is so intense that it echoes the language of Genesis when we hear of the love of the covenant of marriage. Ruth clings to Naomi like one is to cling to a spouse. Ruth gives up any possibility she has for her own well-being by returning to her homeland and finding another husband. She rejects that future out of a desperate loyalty to Naomi, a childless widow. You want to know how heroic we think it is for a person to vow loyalty and a commitment to care for their mother-in-law? Did anyone here this week try to find a Mother's Day card for your mother-in-law? There's only ever one on the rack. It's at the bottom. The envelope's faded and the corners are bent. That's how important we think it is to honor and care for mother-in-laws. So Ruth has the wrong background, and she commits to something that we don't find particularly interesting or important. And yet, by the end of the story, we discover that Ruth, the outsider, who pledges loyalty to an insignificant widow, uses her cunning and her hard work to marry Boaz. And together they have a son named Obed. Obed of Bethlehem has a son named Jesse. And Jesse has eight sons, the eighth of which is a shepherd boy named David. And so by divine inspiration that turns our hero archetype on its head, Ruth, the Moabite outsider, without any royal blood, without any cosmic quest to fulfill, she becomes the crucial character to leading Israel to her greatest king. Ruth's Ordinary loyalty and love ensure that the eternal will of God for the nation is realized. This shifts our understanding of a hero. Our notion of a hero as the people of God then is the ordinary, marginal, stubborn daughter-in-law who goes to a new land to care for a woman of no significance those are the heroes in our story, in God's story. In commenting on Ruth, Orthodox Jewish rabbi Jonathan Sachs says, So never write anyone off because of who they are, what their name is, what their ethnic heritage is. The people you least expect it from may surprise you the most. Andrew's words now. Heroes are the ones who commit themselves to the well-being of a person they do not have to serve and so become agents of God's grace. There may be nowhere that we bear witness to this kind of humble hero than in our own Christian sacrament of baptism. We hold forth a child who cannot do anything righteously, who cannot profess a love for God, who cannot commit to living faithfully. And yet, modern-day Ruths by water and the Spirit make our vow to this child, which is the very vow of God, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Ordinary heroes who take pipe cleaners 
and glue sticks and construction paper and show up week after week in damp, mildew-infested Sunday school classrooms to teach children the ways of God for no money and for almost no recognition because you sat in these pews and you made that vow. You load up cars with food and sleeping bags and first aid kits and you drive to Camp Bethel. Some of you just did this two days ago. Where you go, I will go. To play and sing and pray and pour into these children the very faith school students. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Because their God is your God and we're bound together in the waters of our baptism, Moabite and Israelite mother-in-law. That's a hero. That's a hero. That's an ordinary hero. We need your lives to show our Ruth, our daughter, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Rebecca and I will take our vows, but we're a minister's family of, of God and Christ's church to the ways of mercy and compassion, forgiveness and reconciliation, grace upon grace, upon grace. Your faithfulness to God will be their example when they question mine. We're bound together. Each of us in a loyalty we see in Ruth to Naomi Ours is seen in these waters, the waters that make us a new family, brothers and sisters, one to another. For us, that cliche is not true. Blood is thicker than water. It wasn't true for Ruth and Naomi. It's not true for us. Because for us, water is thicker than blood. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. Amen.